Welcome to session two of this course on customer value management. My name is Michael Henlein. I am professor of marketing at ESCP Business School. If you remember the first session, you probably remember that one of the key aspects of customer relationship management is to treat customers appropriately in order to get maximum value, to treat customers as they deserve it in order to get as rich as possible. Now, within CRM, usually treating customers appropriately implies that you treat customers differently depending on the value or the value potential they bring to the firm. So naturally, the first question you should ask is, how can we assess the value or the potential value of a customer? And this is exactly what today is about. We first talk about the concept of customer lifetime value, which is the value that a customer brings to the firm by purchasing products and services. And then we talk about word of mouth and social value, which is the value that a customer can bring to the firm by other sources, most importantly, by influencing other customers to make purchases. So let's dive in with the idea of customer lifetime value. Well, the first question that you could ask yourself is, why do we need a new measure at all? Why can't we use some of the measures we already know in order to find out which customers are worth more than others? For example, from other classes, you might know the concept of market share and sales growth. Market share is the sales of a company or of a product or of a brand relative to the size of the market. And sales growth is the sales that you made this year or quarter or month relative to last year or quarter or month. Now, there are many different challenges and to, in order to calculate both market share and sales growth. And there are many different settings where both of these measures can be useful. However, one key weakness that both of these measures have is they are not customer specific, they are product specific. Imagine you are a company like Evian or Coca-Cola. You can calculate a market share or a sales growth for any type of unit of product as you want for the 1.5 liter bottle, for the 500 milliliter can, for the six packs of 500 milliliter bottles, whatever it is. But all of this is product or brand specific. Market share will never be different for different customers because it's just not a customer-based measure. So if we want to rank products, market share and sales growth can be very useful, but if we want to rank customers, it is not. Now, does that in exchange means that you do not need these measures anymore? And the answer is no. Obviously, if your market share goes down very dramatically from one period to the other, or if your sales growth is negative from one period to the other, there is a problem. Depending on the extent of decrease in market share or decrease in sales, the problem is larger or smaller. But these measures can be used as a judgment of the overall health of your company. Also, many outside stakeholders, like for example, stock market analysts tend to use those measures in order to evaluate how much your company is worth. In exchange, they provide recommendations of whether your stock should be purchased or sold, which has a direct impact on your stock price. But even if those measures are useful, they are not really useful to do what we want to do. What we want to do is we want to rank customers. And for this, we need something else, namely customer lifetime value. So, what is customer lifetime value? Well, let's assume you want to calculate the customer lifetime value that Michael has for, I don't know, a company producing chocolate. The first question that you can ask is, how much money does Michael spend on chocolate in a given year? You call this the size of wallet. The size of wallet is the total amount of money that a customer spends on a given product category in a given period. Michael spends $100 a year on chocolate. The share of wallet is the percentage of that size of wallet that goes to the specific firm we want to calculate CLV for. Out of the $100 Michael spends on chocolate, 40% go to chocolate company A. You multiply 40% of 100, you get $40, and $40 is just the recurring revenue. It's the revenue that chocolate company A makes from Michael every year. Obviously, the company incurs some form of cost in order to produce that chocolate. We call this the recurring cost. You take the $5 recurring cost away from the $40 of recurring revenue, and you come to 35, which is the contribution margin. Now, you theoretically get this contribution margin every year, but obviously, you don't get it forever. There are multiple reasons for this. 
First of all, at some point, customers simply die. Nobody lives forever. But even if customers are still alive, they may die for your company. For example, they may stop purchasing the whole product category. At some point, Michael may decide that he never buys chocolate anymore. Or they may still buy the product category, but for one reason or the other, they may stop buying the brand. It doesn't really matter for us whether the customer dies because there is a physical death, whether the customer dies because the customer stops using the product category, or whether the customer dies, whether the customer dies because of no longer using the brand. It doesn't matter. At some point, the customer is no longer around. And the duration between the first purchase and the last purchase, we call the customer lifetime. In this example, we assume it's 10 years. Now, obviously, there is also the concept of discounting. $35 you get this year is worth more than $35 you would get 10 years from now. If you combine $35 per year over 10 years with a discount rate of, let's say, 4%, you can calculate a net present value. And if you don't know what net present value is, you can go to Wikipedia or here on YouTube and find out tutorials on what this is and why it matters. Well, the net present value of $35 over 10 years with 4% is 295, and you call this the lifetime profit. And now we take away from that lifetime profit what we call the acquisition cost. It's the cost that we had to incur in order to convince the customer to buy from us in the first place. Maybe we had to give me a specific type of promotion. Maybe you had to send me a Salesforce visit. Maybe you made some very targeted advertising to reach me. Whatever it is, there was usually some cost involved in order to convince me to purchase for the first time. Assume this is 50. You take the 50 away from the 295, you come to 245, and the 245 you call the customer lifetime value. And if you sum up the customer lifetime value of all the customers we have, you call it customer equity. When you look at this slide, you have multiple different colors. You have, first of all, a gray box. Well, the gray box is like the core element of CLU. In some settings, companies are not interested in size of wallet and share of wallet. They immediately start with recurring revenues, and they are also not interested in customer equity, but they stop at CLV. So the gray box is the core concept of CLV, while the entire slide is the more extensive concept. Anything that is blue on this slide is a calculation. So it's simply mathematics. Anything that is white on this slide comes from another department in the firm. Usually cost, be it recurring cost or acquisition cost, would come from accounting, and the discount rate would probably come from finance. Now, if you take away all the blue and the white, you end up with three yellow boxes, size of wallet and share of wallet and customer lifetime. And these are the two concepts we focus on now in the next couple of slides.